In the previous video, we talked about the Synagogue of Satan. Um, this video, we're going to talk about who the Jews are today. Um, there's a lot of different opinions about this. So let's um, try to take a look at the history, the uh, history of the Jews, and who they are not and who they are. Um, we're looking at the Jews in this video from a secular, physical, worldly view. In the previous video, we looked at there's a worldly view and a spiritual view. You've heard the adage, as in heaven, so below. There's um, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. So from a spiritual view, as the Apostle Paul showed us, a Jew is a Jew who is one inwardly and not outwardly. That is by the spirit and not by the flesh. But today we are looking at the perspective of a worldly perspective, which is who are the Jews of the flesh? Who are these people? Who is this nation? As I explained in previous videos, the biblical Jewish history includes two temple periods. The first temple was built by Solomon around 966 BC and destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar II, king of Babylon, in 586 BC. The second temple was constructed 70 years later, around 516 BC, and destroyed by the Roman general Titus in 70 AD. The second temple was greatly expanded upon and modernized by King Herod the Great in the first century BC. This is the temple that Jesus Christ preached at and prophesied its fall during his ministry. Now I mentioned before that during the time the Jews were in captivity in Babylon, after Nebuchadnezzar II had destroyed Jerusalem and taken them as slaves for 70 years, the Jews continued to practice their religion and to maintain the law of Moses as much as possible. What I didn't mention is that when the Jews returned from captivity in Babylon under the Persian king Cyrus the Great in 516 BC, many Jews did not return. They decided to stay in Babylon. From that time on, a large Jewish community thrived in Babylon. Now this community in Babylon was large enough to rival the Jewish community in Jerusalem. They had their council and they had their rabbis in Babylon. And when the Jewish community in Jerusalem was put into exile by the Romans, the Jewish community in Babylon actually became the most important Jewish community from the third to the sixth century AD. Why did it end in the 6th century? Because of Islam. That's when Muhammad came into power and the Jewish community in Babylon, which is modern day Iraq, which was just south of Baghdad, um, became um, Dhimmi you know, under Muslim rule. Uh, they had to pay the dhimmi tax and they were like second-class citizens and their schools and their culture was suppressed in many ways and and from that time they fell into obscurity now if you remember we talked about the oral Torah which is also known as the Talmud now the Babylonian community of Jews came up with their own Talmud, which is known as the Babylonian Talmud. And the earlier Jerusalem Talmud was from the Jewish community. Um, these Talmuds, or oral Torahs, eventually were written down. 
So they have what is known as the uh, Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem Talmud. During what was then called the Parthian Empire in the area of Iran, Iraq, um, the Muslim invasion, when that happened, people migrated north from those areas to escape the invasion. The Byzantine Christians migrated north into what is now called Russia, Ukraine, and the Jewish community, many of them migrated north also into that same area. They were escaping the Muslim invasion. And many Jews stayed and survived. They became dimmi. What was what under Muslim rule, there's a dimmi tax for those who uh, do not convert to Islam they um, have to pay an extra tax and they're somewhat suppressed while the Muslims are more free. They're like second-class citizens. So in under Islam, many Jews lived in the caliphate as dhimmi citizens. And the Jewish community in Babylon did survive in this way right up until the uh, Arab-Israeli War in 1948. There was a group of Jews known as the Radanites. Um, they took advantage of the uh, dhimmi status of the Jews, and they were able to run trade between the Caliphate of Islam and between Africa, I Asia, and Europe. And they were, had quite a lucrative trade going on, moving goods back and forth in and out of the caliphate. Um, like others, like Christians from Europe, couldn't just walk into the caliphate, or Africans couldn't just walk into the caliphate. But the Jews who were under the dhimmi status, they could trade goods with Jews outside of the caliphate and they ran goods this way until about the 10th century when the political changes prevented them from doing this any longer and the Radhanites fell into obscurity. Now between 650 and 850 AD there was a nation in what is now Ukraine, Crimea, southwestern Russia uh, that was known as Khazaria. And Khazaria was mainly a mixture of Jews, Muslims, and pagans who had fled the wars, um, beginning with the wars between the Byzantine Empire and Parthia, and also some Muslims later on joined into the Khazarian population. They were mostly outcasts fleeing the wars that kept coming into this area. So the Khazarian population was very much a mixture. Now in the later part of the Khazarian nation, in the 8th century, uh, it is said or reported that the Khazarian elite uh, converted to Rabbinic Judaism. So, and then they ruled this empire. And this gives rise to a lot of modern day conspiracy theories, the Khazarite Jews, the Khazars, who rule the world. Um, that's where this comes from. So having dhimmi status in the caliphate allowed the Jews to run trade in and out of the caliphate. And northern Africa used to be a part of the Roman Empire. There was a Roman road going right from Egypt into Morocco and up into Iberia, which is now Spain, where the, uh, the uh, water is very narrow there and it's easy to cross. 
so the Jews were uh, running trade through this area and into Spain, into the Iberian Peninsula. And the Jews um, from this time, they were in Egypt also, and their, the, the Jewish population was spread into much of northern Africa along the north coast of Africa, along the Mediterranean coast. And they were also into the north eastern coast of Africa, the Horn of Africa, and down in towards Kenya. Now, there wasn't really many Jews on the slave coast of Africa. The slave trade uh, was very much centered around the slave coast of Africa and into South and North America. Uh, there wasn't a lot of Jewish population in that area. Most of the slaves would have been tribal Africans. There were some Africans who converted to Judaism and there were also some who converted to Muslim. But the, the Jewish Africans if any, would have been very, very few and very much a minority who were caught up in the slave trade and taken to the Americas. This idea that the Jews, all the Jews, disappeared and became slaves in the slave trade, taken to America as black Jews, is not feasible at all. Uh, understanding the history of the Jews. There's another type of Jews called the Sephardi Jews. Um, they were, or, or the, the other way they are called is the Hispanic Jews. And these are the Jews who populated the Iberian Peninsula. The Iberian Peninsula is what today we would call Spain and Portugal. Now, Jews have populated there's there's some disputes over when it began but since the Roman Empire um, some say even before that but um, definitely during the time of the Roman Empire there was great Jewish communities in the Iberian Peninsula and when Jerusalem was taken by Titus and Vespasian um, there was a great number of Jewish slaves taken to Rome and many or the, the, the bulk of these slaves were actually sent to Iberia which bloated the populations of Jews that were already there. So the Jews have a long history in Iberia and this also lended um, more strength to the time when the Jews were running trade from North Africa to Iberia because the Jews who in North Africa who had demi status were trading with the Jews who were living in Iberia and this gave them a great economic advantage over most other people. Now, when Rome, when Rome became Christian in the 3rd century AD, um, there was a lot of controversy over the relationship between Judaism and Christianity. Because of the Jewish-Roman wars in the 1st and 2nd century, the um, Romans came out with very many laws against Jewry or Judaism and the Christians were distancing themselves from Jews in several ways and when Rome became Christian this became even more so that Christians began uh, to become more, much more secular for one thing because when Rome became Christian all of the secular elite who saw an advantage in being a Christian became Christians. And then they started to make more and more strict laws 
against Jewish practices and to distance Christianity from Judaism even more than it was. And this was especially the case in Rome, Syria, and Palestine because that was where the wars took place. And Rome still had uh, an adversity towards Jews. They had lost two of their most elite legions to the Jews. And they don't forget those types of things very easily. Now, in Iberia, in the 4th century, uh, there were laws regarding the relationship between Christians and Jews became more prominent because there was such a large Jewish com community and the Christians had the advantage of Rome being Christian. They were enacting laws um, governing the relationship between Christians and Jews. Uh, some laws, like for example, it was illegal for a Jew to bless a Christian crop. It was illegal for a Jew to marry a Christian. Um, if a Christian married a Jew, it was punishable by death, where if they married a pagan, it was punishable only by a beating or something. It was worse. The Jews were put on a worse level than pagan. After Rome fell, Iberia was taken over by the Visigoths, who were Christian, but they were Arian Christian. Now, Arianism, the basic problem with Arianism that uh, Rome had was that Arians believed that Jesus was a step lower than God. He was the son of God, but he was not God. So it was this type of thing that they had an issue with. But the Visigoths were Arian. So from the 4th to the 6th century, the Jews in Iberia um, had somewhat of a very, not a bad relationship with the leading, with the with the ruling class of Visigoths. But at the end of the 6th century, the Visigoth monarchy converted to Roman Catholicism. And it was at the, this period that the Jews came under fire because Roman Catholics were Trinitarian and they were against Arianism and probably even more so against Judaism. And this is when the Jews were expelled from Iberia. During this time, uh, many Jews fled to, to North Africa. Um, some fled up north into Britain, Amsterdam, uh, into the northeastern European cities. And there were some Jews who converted to Christianity in name only and stayed in Iberia, but underground they practiced Judaism, but on the surface they claimed to be Christians. Now, during the beginning of the 8th century, the Muslims invaded Iberia from the North African coast. And this was called the Moors. The Moors invaded Spain. And they took over. And they were very much aided by the Jews, who saw them as liberators, liberating them from the Roman Catholics who hated Jews. And the Jews, along with Islam, uh, very much reestablished their communities in Iberia. And, and they lived side by side with the Muslims, still as a dhimmi status, but they had much more freedom under the Muslims than they did under the Roman Catholic. In the end of the 15th century, the Roman Catholics regained their dominance over Spain. This led to some 
some very large massacres of the Jews in Spain and Muslims. And when the wars were finished, uh, this led to an edict in 1492, once again expelling the Jews from Iberia. They were given three choices, um, convert, leave, or die. So many of them left, um, heading for, again, North Africa. Uh, some headed up into um, the northeastern Europe and Britain. And at this time, America was discovered by Columbus. So Jews, like many others, uh, began to, uh, some of them began to settle in the American colonies, uh, starting a new life in the new world. So uh, Jewish colonies also were, were be starting with the beginning of the discovery of the new world. In Africa, in Eastern Africa, there's a, um, in Ethiopia, there is a, uh, community called Beta Israel, who practiced Judaism. Um, they have been established there since the time of Solomon, when the Queen of Sheba visited Solomon. I talk extensively about this group in episode two in my channel. Uh, Beta Israel in Ethiopia has maintained a strong relationship with Jerusalem right up until the Roman invasion where they were expelled. Um, you, you can see that in episode two where uh, I describe even Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, their conversation also attests to the strong relationship between Ethiopia and Jerusalem. So after the uh, the war, the Roman Judaic wars, uh, many Jews would have fled also into Ethiopia because the Ethiopians were very welcoming there of Jews. There are also some ancient Jewish communities in Somalia, Sudan, and even Kenya. And there's some debate over how they arrived there. Um, I guess the most sensible to me is that they came through Egypt because Egypt has always had a, a strong Jewish community since the time of Judah. Um, when Assyria invaded Judah under Sennacherib, many Jews fled into Egypt, which was uh, offering them protection. This was about... Oh, the um, 7th century BC, 8th century. And uh, there was a large Jewish community also at Alexandria, Egypt, where the Greeks built a large library in the 3rd century. And since the Jews have always been a very intellectually oriented people, uh, Alexandria was a natural attraction for Jews in Egypt. So the largest community of Jews was in Alexandria. So this is a, a logical place where Jews would have migrated south from Egypt into Somalia, into Ethiopia, and down the eastern coast of Africa, and also into Libya and, and along the northern coast of Africa into uh, what is now Morocco and even up into Iberia. The Jews have settled all these areas for many centuries, even before the Roman invasion. When Jesus was a child, he escaped Herod. Uh, Joseph and Mary had to run from Herod and they went to Egypt. Jesus most likely spent his childhood in Alexandria. Uh, among the large Jewish population that was there. Um, it was in Alexandria where the Septuagint translation of the Hebrew Scriptures was written. That's a translation from the Hebrew into the Greek. Um, that was done at Alexandria. 
uh, by the uh, Egyptian Jewish population. There are also some large Jewish communities in India. Uh, they trace their ancestry back to the kingdom of Judah, and some of them trace their ancestry back to the Lost Ten Tribes. They have been there since antiquity. There are others who trace their ancestry back to the uh, Persian Empire. There's Jews in Afghanistan and in Iran who trace their ancestry back to the Persian Empire. There are even Chinese Jews in China who trace their ancestry back to the Persian Empire. When the Persian Empire had trade arrangements with China, um, Jews were settling in China. This is uh, 4th, 5th century BC. Now when the Arab-Israeli War broke out in 1948, there were many large Jewish communities in the Arab lands. And after the 1948 ceasefire, um, the Jews were expelled from the Arab lands. And most of them migrated as refugees into Israel. And some of them went to other parts of the world, but the majority of them went to Israel. And this is basically how Israel became a nation overnight, was this expulsion bloated their numbers. Let's see, what have we got? We've got 120,000 Jews expelled from Iraq, 73,000 Jews expelled from Egypt, 47,000 Jews expelled from Yemen, 37,000 Jews expelled from Libya. So this is only a quick look at Jewish history. You could spend days looking at this stuff in detail. Um, today there are Jews all over the world, in every country. They're not only in Israel. And they speak many languages and they adapt somewhat to every culture, but they maintain their Judaism. So there are different flavors of Jews. Um, people talk about the Ashkenazi Jews or these other kinds of Jews. Those are only a minority in the Jewish population. So it's not like they run all the Jews. You, you can't put all the Jews into one basket. There's Judaism is a worldwide phenomenon. And there are different cultures and different nations and different races who all are Jews because they were sp dispersed throughout the world. And now, since 1948, they all have this affinity towards Jerusalem and Israel. So now they have their own state once again, but they still live all over the world. The, the nation of Israel probably couldn't contain them. There are so many if they all moved to Israel. Now, 2,700 years ago, the prophet Isaiah prophesied the regathering of the Jews. The Jews have not merely been a small ethnic group who were kicked out of Israel and who went somewhere and who then were taken over by somebody. It just doesn't work that way. They're actually a very diverse community all over the earth. And they have been since ancient times, the, not everywhere on the earth, but they've been in China, they've been in India, they've been in Africa, and even in Iran, Afghanistan, since the Persian Empire, and even before that. So when the Jews were kicked out of Israel by the Romans, that doesn't represent all of Judaism. 
that was the Jews losing their temple and losing Jerusalem. That's the important part that we discussed in the previous episode. These elite um, Ashkenazi and Khazarians um, converting to Judaism doesn't mean just because in one country the elite, the elite converts to Judaism at some point in history, this doesn't make all the Jews in the world no longer Jews. Um, people take these events and try to say, oh, the Jews converted and they're not Jews and this is what Jesus means when he says those who say they are Jews but they are not. Uh, he's not saying that the Jews are not Jews anymore. He's saying that my Jews, I, as we discussed in the previous video, he's saying I am the king of Judah and those who follow me are the real Jews. But he's speaking of spiritual things. The Jews in the world, that's a different thing. That's worldly things. So they are still the Jews, um, physically speaking. They are the Jews. But, they ha but their kingdom is desolated. They have lost that status until they say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But we can't sit here and say, oh, the Jews aren't Jews anymore. And if, since they're not the Jews, now we're the Jews. You can't say that. It, it doesn't make any sense. So the Jews have always been a, a very intellectual people. And they've been uh, the bankers, the lawyers, the businessmen. It's because they have raised their children in Judaism. And Judaism very much favors these types of industries, these intellectual industries, uh, people of learning and education, high education. It's just a part of their heritage and their culture. And because of this, uh, they do dominate the banking system. And they do dominate politics, media, and these important industries which r guide the world in many different ways. So this leads to these conspiracy theories. Oh, the Jews are running the world. They are in some ways, but they're not the only ones. There's uh, others also who are not Jews, who are competing with Jews. And they also have dreams of world domination. Uh, some Jewish groups may have dreams of world domination, some don't. It's not the case that there's this one group. It's uh, maybe one ideology that several groups are, uh, they have a common goal, so they join up. But once they reach their goal, that's when they begin to fight with each other. Uh, there may be some Jewish groups involved in this, like people talk about the Rothschilds or the Illuminati, this kind of stuff, the Ashkenazis. Um, there may be groups like this, but they're not as powerful and as exclusive as people let on. And it doesn't envelope the entire community of Jews. These are minority communities of Jews who are doing this if they're doing this. There are others too who are very much a threat that are not Jews. Um, I don't think Jesus was talking about this in the letter to the Philadelphians. He was talking about his kingship over Jews and Jews kingdom being desolated. Physically Jews are still Jews. They have been there the whole time and they're still there. And they're no lesser than any other nation. They're no greater than any other nation. Um, they have the oracles of God, but they don't really understand what they have 
until they have Jesus Christ. This is the, the theology from a Christian standpoint, from the words of Jesus. Um, obviously they disagree and they have rabbinic Judaism and the synagogue system. Um, now the synagogue of Satan, this sort of alludes to Satan is a prince of this world and mankind is uh, gravitates towards satanic principles and the world is very much given over to the enemy, uh, but through death, God is um, setting up a filter that upon death, men are judged on whose side you are on, God's side or Satan's side. And this is through faith in Jesus Christ. So this is how Christianity works. So when you look at the Jews, they carry the oracles of God, but they are at a status among the other nations until they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay, from 1858 until 1922, there was a man who lived whose name was Ben Judah or Ben Judah or uh, translated that would mean son of Judah. So this man named Ben Yuda, he is uh, known as the father of modern Hebrew language. He lived in, he grew up in the Russian Empire in the late 19th century, and he moved to Jerusalem. And he uh, started a Jewish dictionary, which he published out of Jerusalem. At this time, Jerusalem was only like a village. There was only a few hundred people living there, of Arabs and a few Jews. And he moved in there, and right in Jerusalem, and he lived there for decades. And he published this Jewish dictionary. And he was opposed by some rabbis. Uh, the rabbis believed that Hebrew was a holy language and should only be used for holy things, while Ben Yuda was uh, working to modernize the Hebrew language. Um, there are modern things like uh, a car engine or a bicycle that there is no Hebrew word, or there was no Hebrew word, and he would join um, ancient Hebrew words like two wheels and join them two words together and you have the modern Hebrew word for bicycle. And he did this with many different words and every month or every time he published his uh, newsletter, he would publish a few more modern Hebrew words and building his dictionary. And uh, eventually, he, he he built quite a large dictionary of modern Hebrew and some of it survived and some of the Hebrew words he came up with didn't survive but he's very much given the credit for being a father of modern Hebrew language there's a street in Jerusalem named after him now so this Ben Yuda he was like one of the first Zionists, I suppose. He, he had this love for Jerusalem and this desire for Jews to once again live in Israel. Uh, that's why he actually just moved there when very few other people did. So my point being is when the Ashkenazi Jews are in Europe somewhere, running a banking system, does this make Ben Yuda not a Jew anymore? Or when some other Jews like the Rothschilds are taking over the banking system of Europe, does this make Ben Yuda no longer a Jew? You can't group the entire community of Jews into one group like that. It just these these groups that are doing these things are not even one percent of Jews. 
So let's uh, take another look again at Isaiah chapter 11, starting in verse 11. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. This is basically from Iraq, Egypt, uh, Africa, Western India, Afghanistan, Iran, and from Greek, Greece. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations. So he's setting up a sign for the nations, for all the nations of the earth. And he shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Now this is happening in 1948 in Israel. Um, there's also a duality to this prophecy um, that you can look at it from a spiritual or a physical perspective. The spiritual perspective is in Jesus Christ when Ephraim and Judah are joined together and all nations are being gathered into uh, Christianity and Judah is also gathered in as a part of this as the first apostles were all Jews and the first Christians were Jews. It began as a sect in Judaism but then it went out to all nations. So it can be taken this way but there's also a physical way to look at it, which is in 1948, when the dispersed of Judah are gathered from the four corners of the earth. And he ends saying, The envy of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. Ephraim is the lost ten tribes who were dispersed uh, during the time of the Assyrian invasion. But then uh, I explained in the last episode how Ephraim represents Christianity. So Ephraim and Judah joining together is the relationship between Christians and Jews. The envy of Ephraim shall depart. So during Roman times, the Christians envied the Jews or they had this adversity with Jews. There's no longer that adversity between Christians and Jews. Uh, they very much get along now. They agree to disagree. So today it is the Abrahamic tradition that joins them together. They have gotten past all of those ancient animosities. They're still out there, but generally speaking, it's not like it was. Um, now, spiritually, the Jews and the Christians in ancient times were one. They were actually, uh, the Jews who became Christians were joined together as one with the Christians, the real Christians, not the naysayers or gladhanders who joined when Rome became Christian. Uh, they were persecuted together for 300 years. So at that time, they were like one. So this concludes episode 18 for us. And um, now we're going to go back to the book of Genesis. We followed a few rabbit holes to help us understand the gravity of these tribes under Jacob. Jacob's 12 sons and the prophecies related to them and the, the profound nature of the book of Genesis and its prophetic implications. So now we can get back to where we left off in our study of Genesis. So I'll see you again in the next video. Thank you very much.